Welcome to the Be Disciples podcast. I am your host, Dakota Smith, here today with our co-host, Brandon Sands. And then our guest speaker today, we have Jay Warner Wallace. Uh, Jim, how are you doing today? Doing really well. Then thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We really appreciate your ministry. Your ministry is called Cold Case Christianity. Uh, that can be found at coldcasechristianity.com. You've written a few books. Uh, Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. Uh, God's Crime Scene, a cold case detective examines the evidence for a divinely created universe. Forensic Faith, a homicide detective makes the case for a more reasonable, evidential Christian faith. You have a new book coming out called Person of Interest. Uh, before we jump into me asking you about your testimony, tell us about your new book. Well, a lot of it is what we're talking about in terms of, you know, your podcast deals with discipleship. And so what we're looking at in person of interest is the evidence for Christianity that's outside the New Testament. So imagine a scenario in which you have access to no New Testaments. If all you had was the history of humanity, both leading up to the appearance of Jesus and following the appearance of Jesus. In other words, if all you had were the fuse and the fallout of the explosion known as Jesus, you could still make a case for um, what everything we know today about Jesus. That's how much his fingerprints are on all aspects of culture. Even the history that leads up to Jesus can tell us something about what's about, about to happen. And one of the things that's interesting is, is, you know, we are called, as you know, to make disciples. And I think a lot of the time we, um, we mistakenly think that that verse is really about just called to preach the gospel or called to make converts. When in fact, making a disciple is a lot more difficult, as you know, and it takes a lot more time. And it's a teaching process, a teaching and learning, a modeling and following the model process. But that teaching process of making disciples established Christianity very early on as, a, as an educational type of worldview. In other words, to disciple somebody means you've got to impart some, some teaching. And that teaching DNA that's in Christianity um, served it very well and also led to the formation of modern education as we know it. So it turns out that all modern universities, for example, descend from three universities that were founded by Christ followers. Why? Well, because they are trying to make disciples and disciple means you've got to do some teaching. And so you're going to probably, if you want to disciple with the New Testament, you're going to probably need to have people who can read the New Testament. That meant that a lot of translation was done globally to get the New Testament into all kinds of languages. And a lot of these folks didn't read, uh, and so they didn't have a written alphabet. Uh, Christians were responsible for creating many new alphabets that could be read by people groups that had no prior access to this kind of education. And that led, of course, to the education in lots of other areas as well. So that discipleship DNA is part of what we trace in this book called Person of Interest. And what we're really trying to do there is to show that you've got more than enough reason to believe Jesus is who he said he was, even if you didn't have access to the New Testament, just from the fuse and fallout of history. Wow, that, that's pretty incredible. I'm intrigued already to read the book. What, what motivated you to write this book from that particular bent? Well, when you build, you know, our, our cold cases, and these are just homicides, and that, that means they're unsolved. That's why they're still open. If they had been really, you know, um, great evidential cases to begin with, if, if we had a good piece of evidence to start with, if we had an eyewitness to start with, this wouldn't have gone cold. It went cold because uh, you have to kind of do the extra work. And that often means putting together a cumulative case from all kinds of bits and pieces that you might overlook otherwise. And so you end up um, assembling a large cumulative case based on circumstantial evidence, both in the crime scene and outside the crime scene. So this book just kind of traces what, what my own personal experience was as a new investigator of scriptures. I was 35. I was already working as a detective. I'd been there about eight years. And I knew how to investigate uh, cases like this. And I knew there would be evidence in the crime scene of the New Testament. And there should also be evidence outside. Look, if Jesus is who he said he was, do we really think that the, 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 the entire story of Jesus would be limited and only found in four Gospels written in a, a small corner of the Roman Empire? Wouldn't we expect, if Jesus is God, that he would make a huge splash in history? Well, that's what I, you know, I think for the most of us, at least in Los Angeles County where I am, I was not raised in an educational system that taught me much at all about Jesus. 
So for, for me, uh, this was, uh, you know, as a 35 year old guy, it was eye opening to discover how much impact Jesus actually had. And that's kind of what I'm tracing in this book. You know, it's, 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 it's a book that is like most of my books, it's illustrated. Uh, there's over 400 illustrations in the book. It's kind of like a graphic novel. I also tell a murder mystery that relates to this process of using fuse and fallout. It's a no body murder case that I worked a number of years ago. And so we kind of trace that no body murder case and we parallel it to the story for Jesus. So it, it kind of it works on a couple of different levels, the book. And the idea here was just really had to help people to see that there's really not much excuse. The, the case is overwhelming. But look, a lot of it when it comes to discipling people is to not just show, um, you know, what does scripture teach? That's, of course, the most important thing. You know, what do we, everything we know about Jesus, we find in the New Testament. And so I, I don't want to ever stray from the New Testament, but it turns out that people all throughout the ages have relied on the teaching of the New Testament to find, to found, to, uh, to ground the most important aspects of culture, art, music, education, literature, science, even other non-Christian religions have, have, have relied on information from the New Testament as the foundation for their work. And you can reconstruct those pieces from the New Testament, even if somebody had somehow destroyed every New Testament. You cannot erase Jesus from the collective identity of musicians, artists, um, writers, scientists, educators, and even people who think about other religions uh, that aren't even Christians. You know, Jesus is on the pages of many other religious texts uh, in a way. Uh, and so, this, for example, you know, Jesus precedes. Uh, Islam. So you, not surprisingly, you find Jesus on the pages of the Quran. But Jesus does not precede Buddhism. Buddhism actually precedes Jesus. Yet Buddhist leaders will find a way to illustrate that Jesus somehow fits into their system. Sure. He's another wise, enlightened teacher on the way to <laughs> Buddhahood, right? Well, it's interesting that, that every other world religion accommodates Jesus, even when that religion precedes Christianity. But Jesus never accommodates anyone else, even those that precede Jesus. Yeah. It's only a one-way street. So, so there's a lot you can look at in history to be able to reconstruct the story of Jesus. And what I'm trying to do is to help people to, I mean, look, you know that there are people um, in your community that know more about the local college teams and the history of those teams. And those, those football teams or whatever it may be, whatever sport is big where you are. Uh, they know more about the history of those teams than they even do about the history of their own faith. Absolutely. Than they, than they even do about the history of the Bible, how it was assembled and what it teaches. Well, right. how is it we're better disciples of things that don't even matter than we are of the master? Yeah. And so a lot of it is, are we, are we interested enough to not just look on the pages of scripture, but look in every nook and cranny of our lives to see the fingerprints of Jesus. That's what we're trying to do with books like this. Wow, that's so convicting. You're right on the sports theme as well. We're 25 minutes south of Lawrence, Kansas, and the KU Jayhawks. You know, KU basketball is huge here, and there's all kinds of K-State football fans, and they're just fanatics. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, my you wife know? says this all the time. I, I actually, you know, uh, my wife's favorite season is football. So we, we right. will spend a lot of time watching <laughs> football, right, on, on, on the weekends, and we'll record it, so we'll watch it all week long. As a matter of fact, we haven't even watched Monday Night Football, so do not tell me who wins that game, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but, but I will tell you that, um, that we watch this stuff, and I'll often tell her, it's this guy here. He used to play over there, and then he was the backup over here. He went to that college. He, he almost got the Heisman Trophy. He was number three in the running, and, and she's like, really? Like, why do you even know all that? How do you know that? <laughs> yeah, well, and you're right. It's just cluttering up headspace that that God has, has given us, probably not for the purpose of memorizing football stats. But but the question becomes, how do we turn corners? So, so what I'm trying to do with the book, like any of the books we write, and when we teach in the church, what are we trying to do? We're trying to, to take the, the, we're standing on the shoulders of scripture, and we're trying to find a way to help people see how how awesome it is to study scripture who maybe for whatever reason have never done that before. And so we're trying to make the scripture accessible to them. We're trying to make that the, we're trying to contextualize it so they can see how it applies to their own lives. Exactly. We're trying to get them interested in the things they ought to be interested in and stop being getting hung up on the things they shouldn't be interested in. Right. And that's a, a project for all of us personally. And then for those we disciple. So a lot of it is trying to figure out how do I throw this ball in a way that people want to catch it? Yeah, that's no, Absolutely. Lot. As, a, as an aside, do you have a favorite football team to put on record that you root for? 
Yeah. So I used to, and let me tell you what's changed for me. Okay. You really want to get into this conversation. So what Let's changed for me is well, I'm in Los Angeles. So there's two of everything here. You got the Rams yep. and the Chargers, you got the Lakers and the Clippers, you got the Angels and the Dodgers, right? You got yep. the Kings and the Ducks. I mean, you got two of everything. Um, and so what I started a number of years ago, a good friend of mine, he, who you may have known, this is called Red Zone. It's on NFL Network. The Red Zone just covers all of the games in real time. As soon as the game enters into the Red Zone, it pops over to that game. You can, you can watch Yes. And so I watch this because Scott Hansen, believe it or not, is a very committed Christian. Wow, and he's really? very interested in Christian apologetics. He's even an endorser on my next on this book. I, this person of interest. Yeah, he's very much uh, interested in making the case for Christianity. And he's the host of this show. Yeah. And so I watched this show for years now. What it does is it ruins you because you're uh, you're watching every single game every single s Sunday, but you're only watching a few minutes before it pops over to the other game. So it it, it kind of conditions you to follow players rather than teams right because you know like, you, <laughs> yeah. like your team is not the only team you're watching every sunday you're watching everyone's team sure, but now yeah. there's certain players that you're going oh i love that running back you know i love this right. i love that guy so so there are people i really love in, in the sport uh, most of them are like committed believers that i follow that i'm thinking i'm rooting for them right sure. because i want to see them do well Sure. I want, and they struggle sometimes with their character. They struggle sometimes with their game, but I know they're Christ followers. And when it comes right down to it, I'm rooting for the brother, you know, in the faith <laughs> that he'll have an opportunity to, to shine. Um, so I'm really a now a player guy. And so yeah. that's, that's been most of it. You know, if I had a team right now, it'd be hard, it'd be hard for me to, to put my finger on a team. Right. Sure. You know, another one of the guys I really love is Nick Foles, who was, you know, he played for the Eagles and the Super oh, he's Bowl. Solid. Eagles. solid guy. And and uh, he's another guy who, you know, he's right now he's back up in Chicago, but I'm just rooting for Nick to get back on the field because I just want to see God work. God did the amazing thing through him and he turned it right around and gave God all the glory. So he had this opportunity, this window in which he was the MVP of the Super Bowl. And Isn't when crazy? given that chance to talk about it, he immediately began to talk about his relationship with God. He loves, you know, he wants to be a youth pastor someday. So Amen. I just think he's just an amazing guy. So I root for players now. Most of, most yeah, of them. I spent a little bit of time years ago with the Tebow family yeah. uh, in, in the Philippines. And, you know, Tim was in the league for a yep. few years. Uh, unfortunately, no longer. I was, I was pulling for him when he was with Jacksonville. Just right. Yeah, he has a tight end. I was, I was too. Yeah, but here we are, right? We're talking about, okay, we're, we now know, well, he's a brother, so that's why we're following him probably, but we know, we've tracked the, 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 the fledgling career of a guy who tried for a tight end and was cut from a team. A team that last year did not win. Did they win a single game in last year? They've got one win so the far. Game. The first game. Okay. So this, <laughs> this year they've got, you know, I think one win also. So, I mean, here, here we are. Why do we know all that? And I guess what it comes down to is I'm, I'm curious as to, there's lots of stuff in scripture that we just don't know. And a lot of it's because if we're honest, we have a sense that the football stuff is real in a way that we've experienced and we know it's real. And this we hope is real, but we're not as convinced deep down that this isn't a little more than wishful thinking. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do in the terms of discipleship with books like this, is I'm trying to get people to realize that, you know, like it or not like it, this is not wishful thinking. This is objectively true, not a matter of my personal opinion. We can make a case for this. We can demonstrate it uh, evidentially. And in my own kid's life, I can tell you that my son, David, will often say that, you know, it, even as you grow up and you have a season of wandering or a season of maybe thinking it's not wishing it wasn't true. He was stuck because he had been raised with enough information that he knew that it was objectively true. Mm -hmm. And then you're far more likely to return to it. Amen. So, so I think for, for me, you're also going to act differently if you think that something is true rather than you hope it's true. Because yeah. you you you're going to return to it. I often in the first book I talked about this idea of a bulletproof vest. I had a case once where this guy was got involved in a shooting, and and it was a horrific shooting. And the guy had got the draw on the officer before the officer could get, the, get his gun out of his holster, so he knew that he was going to have to do something to avoid being killed. Yeah. But he remembered he had his bulletproof vest on, and and he had seen that vest stop bullets in the range. So he just decided to tense up his stomach muscles and take the first couple of rounds while he gets his gun out of his holster. Yeah. 
rather than jump around to try to tackle somebody, jump behind something. He says, as long as I don't get shot in the head, I can probably survive this because I'm wearing my vest. And the reason why he stood calmly in that situation was because he had a good evidence that the vest could stop bullets. He'd seen it stop the bullets in the range. So I think part of it is, is that you, you behave differently in a crisis if you, if, if you come at it from an evidential perspective, right? Like he knew that vest could stop bullets. It wasn't wishful thinking. So he was willing to trust it calmly in a crisis. And I think what we have to help our young people do is to, to know this is not, we're not here because my, my parents were not Christians. When I was growing up, there was nobody in my family who was a Christian. Yeah. I be, Take I became, us into that a little bit. Well, I became the first, maybe, well, I guess, I mean, I may have had, I wonder about my, my dad's grandparents a little bit. Like, I mean, where were they? And, but, but I didn't know anybody who was a Christian and I never went to church for any purpose other than like a wedding or a funeral. So, so, um, you know, looking at Jesus for the first time, buying a Bible, I bought a pew Bible, uh, just to see what, what was so great about Jesus, because this pastor started off by telling us, you know, the first day I was in that church, and he probably said this a number of times, but I had never heard it. He said that Jesus was super smart, the smartest man who had ever lived. And I just wanted to know if that was true. And that's what got the whole thing started for me is just see what the red letters say. And so, you know, I've written now about the, the case inside scripture and the case outside scripture in two books, but that really was my journey. It was just, Hey, how do I know if this is true? And, and for me, I'm not about to assess what the scripture is. I'm not about to accept what they say about me until I first can trust what they're saying about Jesus. So I just wasn't interested in the gospel until I tested the gospels. So that's, that's kind of who I was at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, we know just you as an apologist, we're so grateful for your faithfulness uh, to serve Jesus and what you're doing. That's, re- that's what it is to us is we're so grateful that you would stand to say, look, there's a bullet vest that you can count on. <laughs> uh, right. and right. those, three of those areas are the, the life of Christ, the reliability mm-hmm. of the Bible, yep. and the emphasis on, on Christian worldview. So if you yep. were to just go through those three in somewhat of a, a cursory fashion, you know, mm-hmm. What was that investigation like for you and your journey? How did you grow in those areas? Why do you feel they're important? Just kind of jump off that launch pad and and help us out with those three points. Well, it was a messy process for me because all investigations are relatively messy. You have a certain course. You think I'm going to do these 10 things in this order. And then by the time I get done, this guy should be ready to put handcuffs on him. But the reality is something will pop up in the middle that's time sensitive that causes you to rabbit trail. And I was doing a lot of that. So uh, for me, it comes down to, like you said, the three things. First of all, let's go to biblical reliability. Can you trust what the Bible is telling you is true? Now, look, those gospels, at least uh, uh, pretend to be, uh, accurate accounts of a chronology of sequence, a, a sequence of events that occurs in history from the birth of Jesus to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, that, that really is an eyewitness claim, all right? This somebody's going to say that I was there to see this happen. John is going to say that at the end of his gospel. Luke is going to say that he was, you know, he was there with Paul in the book of Acts, and then he's speaking to the people who were eyewitnesses and servants. Okay, so you're telling me this is an eyewitness account somehow handed down to either Luke or from Peter to Mark or just Matthew directly or John just directly from what they saw. Well, you can test eyewitness accounts. And that's what I had to do to to know that these were reliable. And and there's actually a process. It's in every set of jury instructions. I'm sure it's, it's true in Kansas. It's true in California that you have a certain number of questions you can ask of eyewitnesses. And so I I just began asking those questions of the Gospels to see if they would pass the test. And they do pass the test. And that gave me at least the confidence they were telling me something true about Jesus. And the real question when it comes to Jesus is just, did he rise from the grave? You know, is that is the resurrection true? The resurrection is the one claim that matters more than any other claim related to Jesus because it puts him in a different category if it actually occurred. It gives him a certain authority that would be unusual, right? I have a tendency to listen to people who pop out of the grave, and this is somebody who did. So that would change the way I consider what he says, the reliability of what he says. So a lot of that um, is what I started to do in my own investigation of the Gospels. And then a Christian worldview is really how we answer the most important questions that everyone asks. How do we get here? How's it, why do you get so messed up? And how do we fix it? Those three questions are answered by every worldview. 
So uh, Marxism has an answer for those three questions. So does Christianity. Right. And so I, and the, the question is, does the Bible and the biblical worldview describe the world the way it really is? Sure. And it turns out once you have confidence that it does, well, then you can seek the answers that the worldview provides. I'll give you an example of this, just in the most recent terms. Of, I'll give you something kind of rather controversial. When we're talking about critical race theory or any um, claim that assumes that if we could just change the system, that we could make the world better. Right. And I think that's a noble effort, and we should try to correct systems that are errant. And correct systems. Yeah, that are broken. But here's the assumption in that worldview. The people who hold that view have a worldview that describes how do we get here? Why is it so messed up? And how do we fix it? Yeah. Well, that worldview assumes that we are all, if it's a, not a religious worldview, it assumes that we are all just evolved beings. But it certainly assumes that we are blank slates at birth and that we are corrupted then by broken systems. Mm -hmm that change the way we are. And a lot of atheists believe this to be the case. We're born either neutral or uh, in, a, in a state of goodness that is then corrupted by groups or corrupted by experiences or corrupted by systems. Yep. If we could just change the way we raise kids or change the systems they're in, we can fix the brokenness of humans. But of course, our worldview is slightly different than that, right? It actually claims that we are broken people after the right. fall, and that regardless of whatever system you put in place, we will find a way to leverage it for our prideful, arrogant, self-serving motives, and we'll leverage it against you. You see, it starts off with a different view of humans. If the other view is right, that we are neutral or blank slates that are corrupted by our environment and systems, then we should always be seeking to change our environment and systems. Right. If, on the other hand, our worldview is right and we are fallen, broken people that regardless of system changes, we will find a way to corrupt it. Well, now we're going to want to create systems that have so many checks and balances because they are checking and balancing against expected human evil because right. we are those kinds of people. And this is a lot of reasons why the founders of the nation, good or bad, I'm sure that lots of things could be done better. But the idea was to put in those checks and balances because you really can't trust one body of government. We're going to find a way to abuse it. And they sure. do that. So they put in the checks and balances to try to hold back the expected abuse. But and I think that's important for us to see this. See, so worldview has a lot. Now, look, if you're somebody who's in the church and you're like, yeah, I actually think the CRT is biblical. Well, we can have that discussion. But the point is, it's going to depend on the worldview and the way you think about your What does Christianity claim about the nature of humans? And that's going to determine how we move forward with any proposal for CRT or anything else. Yeah, it, it's interesting that there's always a presupposition or a, an ex expectation for a meta narrative of creation, fall, redemption. That, that same thing just keeps coming up regardless of the belief there's a creation, fall, redemption uh, story somewhere in every single belief. And I, I find that fascinating, the point that that you're making. Yeah, I think for a lot of people that we're discipling, uh, regardless of what you're a Christian discipling as a Christian or otherwise, what we all seem to recognize is that something's broken. And I think that's it's that common observation that something's not right that causes us to kind of think in our mind, well, okay, that's well, how do it start? What is it that did it start off bad or did, did something happen that made it bad? And then how do we fix it? Number one, we all have a common desire to fix the thing that we think is broken. And we all unanimously seem to agree that something's not right here. And so now the question is, how could it be that we could not just live along peacefully? Now we've got some creation stories that try to explain the friction we see in the second question of worldview before we can get to the third question about how we fix it. So I think it's our, our common uh, observation of the brokenness of the world that causes us to think in worldviewish ways to begin with. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. As I'm, I'm thinking about our show, Be Disciples podcast, you know, we're, we have efforts to reach our town. You know, we're talking content right now, but I want to take us a little bit more into the practical or into the how. Give us your counsel. I know you've got a, a huge background in youth ministry. I know that uh, from some of your testimonies in the past, you know, you had spent time ministering to a number of youth and seeing the things they struggled with and the environment in which they live. What is your counsel to us as a church 
as far as reaching today's youth. Uh, we also have a presence at, at the local university here. Our college ministry is growing. What would you say to parents? What would you say to college students? Where do we really need to focus based on the times that we live in today? What, what first comes to mind for you? Well, do you really want the answer? Uh, because most people don't like the answer. Uh, I want so, the answer. <laughs> so here's what it comes down to. Um, uh, do you right now, Dakota, do you have kids? Yes, sir. How old are your kids? Six years old, four, two, and eight months. Okay, great. Okay, so now you've got um, a kids. That I bet you it's been a while since you got to go on the kind of vacation you would have gone on with just your wife before you had kids. Now you're oh, going yeah. on vacation. Yeah, now you're taking vacations that are basically kid vacations, kid friendly. You haven't probably seen a movie that you want to watch forever. You're just watching kids movies right now. You haven't been to a restaurant that you would like to go to. You're you're just picking the stuff you can afford and the stuff that works for your kids. In other words, right in, yeah, in that season of parenting, you're making all kinds of conscious choices against your own um desires and uh, really with the benefit of your kids in mind, because when you're in that season of raising kids, kids are more important and you're willing to make sacrifices for your kids. Everyone who's got kids who's listening to this podcast knows that is true. Well, we're a family right now. We're called the church and we've got kids. We are always going to have kids. So here's a question. Are we willing as the older people in the church to sacrifice for the benefit of our kids? They say we are, but you, you don't, you don't, when you get home, you don't say kids, I want you to stay in that other room. I want you to stay in your bedroom. That's the kids room over there. Cause what we're doing over here is adult stuff and we'll come and get you, but we're doing this important stuff over here. The church has affinity groups. We typically put kids in a different room. We don't include the kids. Well, cause it wouldn't be appropriate for the kids. Well, yeah, but, but when you're a family, you don't get to watch the movie that you want to watch. You don't get to listen to the kind of worship that works for you. You're actually focused on students, focused on the young people who are still making a decision about whether or not this is true. And I'll be honest, as families, we, we take that seriously, but as a church, we often don't. So what I always tell people is, are you willing to shift everything you do so that it is made palatable and, made a pro and so that kids have access to it? And it's that age group of about, you know, kind of like junior high and early, maybe, maybe you got to target that, that age group. That's like junior high, high school. And that means that, that when you do a, your messaging and we, we had a church where we did that and we would go long. We, you could just mean it to have a shorter message. It doesn't, I raised the bar. I want to do college age messages for junior hires right. because they will go with you. Now I have to make those visual. Sure. And I've changed the way I communicate, but I'm not like goofing it up. I'm not trying to make it like childish. No, I'm making it actually, I, I, I give talks all over the country and the topics that I write books about. And I don't, and I do talks for junior hires through adults. I don't change the talk and, and not even a single word of the talk has changed. If I'm talking to junior hires, if I'm talking to adults and both groups have no idea that the same talk with the same words works for the other age group. I just have learned that that's, I'm, I got to be able to throw the ball in a way that's interesting, right? That, so you'll want to catch it because we're, we're either going to assign this and say, it's not part of our family. It's going to be out the room. As soon as you get here, you know, maybe we'll do worship together, but probably not. And I want you to go over there because now we're going to do serious stuff. Yeah. Well, don't, don't think they don't, they don't hear that. They don't see that. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out we have to, as parents, we have to take that responsibility on ourselves. You were willing to sacrifice for your kids when you were raising them. Well, we're raising kids right now. Right. Are we willing to do with the stuff that's important to them and be in their presence? And then you say, well, yeah, but I really want to do like a, a, the series on revelation. That's going to be really deep. And, you know, okay, then make that your, <laughs> that's your midweek, then that's your Bob, that's your Sunday school. That's your, that's your breakout. But what we do as a family has to address the issues of the day at a context that young people, and we have to ask two whys for every what. So stop just telling people, stop telling your kids what is true. You know, what's true about the Bible? What's true about Jesus? What's true about God? That's all important, but you can't stop there. They need the two whys. First why is, okay, so why do you think that's true? On the basis of what evidence can you make that claim? Oh, God is triune in nature. Really? On the basis of what evidence... And I'm going to probably need you to show me why that makes sense with the world, not just with your scripture. Yeah. That's what kids want. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then the second question is going to be the second why is, okay, so you think this is true. You made that claim and you gave me some evidence to support it, but why should I care? I mean, I get you're a 60 year old theologian geeked out on theology, but why should I, how's it going to help me tomorrow at school? It's not. So I, why do I care about this? It doesn't even see it's like like dead man's kind of uh, interest and stuff. You know, I mean, I don't want to need to know what the, the 1902 rugby championship was either. <laughs> right. This, it doesn't apply to me. So well, you got to help our students to know why is it true evidentially? And that's where everyone else is doing. They're making claims in the world, but they're saying, well, this is what science says. This is what the facts say. This is what the evidence says. And you Christians have your wishful thinking, blind faith, but that's not going to work over here. Well, that's what they're hearing. So we have to do the two whys. Why is it true? And secondly, why should I care? And if we did that for every topic we talk about, you can still preach to the same verses. You can still preach to the same scripture. But I don't stop there. I kind of show you why this makes sense of the world that you're living in. And that's going to be important to young people. So I think that's the, the bigger challenge is if we really want to make young people our priority, guess we're going to have to make young people our priority. And that means that a lot of the things that, and I had a church where my plan, I had a youth group until our church merged. And then I wanted to do what I call free church where nobody gets paid and there's no mortgage. But that means I had to kind of blow out a room in my house. I put it in 50 chairs. We could never be larger than 50. Yeah. So we were at 50, but I had, I had an emphasis on young people. And I had one couple in their sixties who at some point said, you know, I just, it's too noisy in here. <laughs> I said, no problem. I can show you where the good churches are that aren't so noisy. Right. But we're not uh, changing this. This is for young people. And so we just focused on young people. And that thing will explode because it turns out that young people are willing to be discipled. And Jesus says to come like, a, like children. He doesn't mean to come stupid. He right. means to come and strip off all the stuff that makes old people so rigid and unteachable. Yeah. Right. And it turns out when you're working with young people, you don't have a lot of that. Yeah. You can say, hey, we're going to go take this mountain over here. And everyone will say, what day are we going? Sure. Whereas right. the adults will say, you know, I think I got to work that week. Can't do it. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So so a lot of it is about focusing on young people. That That is such a good exhortation. And I receive exactly what you're saying. I mean, as the senior pastor of our church, I, I receive that. You know, our, our church vision is to live sent which means we want our evangelism to become a culture, you know, a lifestyle, not a, not a program. And our mission is to make disciples. So the two go hand in hand, but I, I receive what you're saying. Well, let me I just really say one more thing about that too, then because since I think you're, if you're up for it, here's the other thing I would say is that what makes the difference, especially with young people is not um, our mission statement. We need to do more work on our mission statement, or I need to do, pull out all my um, my old theology work and do and raise the bar in terms of my theology or raise the bar in terms of my study of Bible. That's all important. But the biggest change you'll make, especially with young people, you'll make on your calendar, on your calendar. I'm not interested in teaching. I'm interested in training. Now, there's a huge difference, and you learn about law enforcement, right? We train. Well, why do we train? Because if I don't train, I'm going to have to apply this thing next shift. When I, if I'm going to train in defensive tactics, it's because I am probably going to end up fighting somebody this week and I need to know how to do this. If I'm going to train in pursuit driving, it's because probably later on in this deployment period, I'm going to, have to drive at high speeds to chase somebody. And because I know that's on my calendar, whether I like it or not, I pay attention to the teaching. Teaching then becomes training because I have a date. Boxers train because they have a date, a calendar in which they're going to have to get in the ring. And sometimes guys will get fat in between fights. But once you're eight weeks in front of that fight you start to train because you don't want to go in that fight fat and get killed you want to go in that right. fight in the best shape of your life so you train toward calendared battles so what i learned early with students is if we say we're going to be a church that is about evangelism then i have to have that on the calendar in which i lead them in that effort so we would put that on the calendar Right. We would just say, okay, now here's the other, here's the other trick. What I've noticed, and you could ask and tell me if I'm wrong, because you're in a place right now where your community is small enough that you can make these adjustments. What I noticed is if you ask your congregation to go do this evangelistic effort, well, you could ask them and you can put it on the calendar and you can train, teach about evangelism for four weeks. 
because you know you have that date coming. We're all going to be out there. You don't want to feel foolish or embarrassed or scared to share the gospel because you're not ready. So you should probably come to our training, which is just your Sunday service. Because on that date, we're going to go. Well, if you put that date on the calendar and it's a day other than the Sunday, you'll get about 20% of your church. If, on the other hand, you put it on the Sunday, right around when you would meet anyway, you'll get 80% of your church. That's good. The extra day is almost too big an ask for a lot of people. Right. So we ended up doing a saying, hey, once a month, our worship service is going to be an active service. Wow. And so we would simply go and do the thing that, and so if we said, I want to teach my students about theology, well, I would take my kids for six days to Salt Lake City to evangelize Mormons. Now we would spend eight weeks getting ready, but that week in Salt Lake City is going to be a test because those folks you're talking to think you're the lost people group and they're actually better prepared right now to evangelize you than you are to evangelize them. We want to teach about worldview and atheism while we're going to spend a week on the campus of UC Berkeley. Those kids there don't even care about God, and the few who do care about such things do not think God exists. So that's going to be a challenge. We're going to prepare you in philosophy and atheism and all of that, so you'll be ready to talk to those people. But it was those calendar trips that changed our calendars in preparation. So then now we had eight weeks that we do a series, and everyone's like super focused because they know they have to go and exercise this on week number nine. So a lot of this is about how do we as leaders in discipling do more than simply teach something. We turn that quarter toward training, which means you've got to have the challenge that you're willing to engage with your congregation on the calendar. And that's, that's tricky. You got to be creative. So if I was teaching about justice and social justice, and I wanted to spend time on the uh, Skid Row in Los Angeles, we have to spend time talking about these issues for weeks until we go to Skid Row. And so we, we just found those things that were important to our people that we wanted to move them in that direction. And we created an event that we could put on the calendar and that, that changed everything for us. One thing that we've been saying recently is, can you prove it to me on your weekly schedule? If I were to ask you to get out your phone, to go to your Google calendar, to look at the date, where do you have time to live? Sin? Where do you have time to make disciples? So what you're saying is, so confirming and i mean before you go on a mission trip you study the people group that you're that's taking right your minister to. that's right no and uh, here's the thing we can say that but could you imagine telling your kids hey um i want you to do this thing so i want to see your calendar to see if you ever do it well they're going to say well pop let me see your calendar why is it we never go as a family you're like you expect me to go on my own to do this well, I'm preparing you to go, but yeah, but you're asking me to, to go on my, like, why don't we do this as a family then? Why isn't it part of our family ethos? So we get caught up in this scenario where we're teaching our family, hey, this is the thing we're never going to do as a family, but I want you to do it on your own. Yeah. So uh -huh. we have to do it as a family. Your kids are watching, by the way. Yeah. They'll know if you're not good at this because you never do it because you're all talk. And they were watching me. So, so when I would go out and we would be on the streets of Salt Lake City and we would be talking to Mormons in front of the temple grounds, like they're listening to our conversations. What does Jim do? Like, how, what's Jim's demeanor? Yeah. Where's his heart? You know, what, does he know enough to be able to engage in this conversation? You know, and so you want to be, you want to model that for my family, but my family is the church. So now I got to be out there and get messy in this situation. It's hard. Listen, I will just tell you, if your congregation has not told you this yet, they probably don't know. But I'll tell you this. It, I think being a pastor is super, super hard. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, it's not for everyone. Uh, I'll, I think actually I'm not a pastor anymore because it's so much easier to be the guy writing books, talking to pastors than it is to be the pastor. <laughs> I'll just tell you, being a pastor stinks. It does. I'm sorry. It there does. Certainly did, yes. Because because you might think, well, my giftedness is in this. I mean, I, I like to love to teach. I love to disciple. Uh, these are just micro. These are like one small slice of the overall pie of being a pastor. And and all the other stuff is like even far more distracting and, um, and, and involving than the stuff you might be. I, I have a very narrow range of gifts. I know that. I learned that because I was a pastor and I got to see all the areas I stink at. Okay. So yeah. I just know that we can't be everything. We have to do the direct kind of exercise our gifts in that narrow range of where our gifts are. 
And so, so a, a lot of what I'm talking about is like, this is why we develop staffs. This is why we try to bring in people who are better in one situation than another. But it is hard, I think, to lead people as a pastor. I don't know. I, I just don't know how anyone yeah. does it for a long period of time. So I give you credit, but trust me. It certainly it can be taxing. It has been taxing. Um, and there's certainly been days where I'm like, Lord, are you sure you want me to do this? <laughs> right, right. Uh, totally get I, it. I, I appreciate your candidness. You know, you've given us just tons and tons and truckloads of application and just really good thoughts. I want to pass it over to Brandon just real quick. Brandon, is there any anything that you want to ask to close? I want to ask uh, Jim, I just want to ask one more question for you yeah. as we, we close, but Brandon, do you have anything that you're processing? What are you What are you hearing him say today? Do you have any questions? Uh, you know, not so much a, um, a question, but there was something that you were talking about earlier about uh, uh, answering those whys um, for yeah, students. Yeah. And I, uh, I've just been kind of rolling that around um, since you said that. And I think that's, uh, there's a lot of truth to that, you know, because uh, the thing is they're going to get an answer somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. They, they might as well get it from, from their leaders and from their parents, from, you know, the church uh, who can guide them in the right direction. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Well, I can always put it this way. I always say, look, if, if kids want to chase stupid uh, and chase their passions for a season after we they leave us and they're going to walk away for a season, no problem. I mean, everyone, I chased my pet. I wasn't a Christian until I was 35. So I get it. I mean, there's going to be times when you're going to want to chase stupid things because that's how we're wired. We're fallen and we all have those kinds of passions. We can choose to, to chase them or not. So I don't ever blame myself as a leader for that kind of thing. But if you're leaving because you don't think it's true, okay, that's on me. The other thing's on you. But when it's because you don't think it's true, I didn't do my job because my job is to make you uncomfortable when you take that season running from God. It's that rubber band theology, right? Do you want to go so far? Cause you let go. It, it hurts more the further away you are when it snaps back. So a lot of what we're trying to do here is just to help kids see that this is true in a way that's hard to deny after the season of stupid. And they'll come back to it because they know it's true. That was true for my, even, you know, my own kids. And it's true for anyone else's kids probably too. You know, there's, there's something that I've found on this show we've had a lot of success with. We had Gary Habermas on. We had Greg Kokel, uh, yeah. Kosti Hinn. We've had some really fun guys. And something that's been unique about our show, and we have asked every one of these guys the same question, is, okay, we know your conversion story. We know you've been walking with Christ. Um, we're grateful to hear from you and to learn all that you've, you've got to add and to give to us in your ministry. But as it stands today... You know, just what are the normal struggles of your walk as a believer? What does sanctification look like today for Jay Warner Wallace, just at the base level? Um, help our people to connect with you. Um, we love your ministry. And yet at the same time, you're a man like each of us. So where are you growing in your walk and how can you personalize that for us today? Yeah, I think it's, it's submission. It's a probably that's true for it. That's kind of the too broad a word that everyone could probably use because it's always some form of submission, right? But how do you submit your desires? How do you submit your anger? How do you submit your pridefulness? There are only three things that ever lie behind any misbehavior. The same three motives for any murder are the same three reasons why pastors fall. They're the same three reasons why anyone makes a mistake and it doesn't change. There's no fourth reason. It's money, financial greed, sexual lust, and the pursuit of power. In that third category, the pursuit of power is a big overarching umbrella that probably captures about 70% of all the stupid things that are done in the world. Wow. And a lot of that is just, you know, because we are so, um, we, we think we matter more than anyone else. And it's about submitting, you know, why, why do we say, did God really say that? Because we have a thought that we think it should be, we want to, we really want to follow our own way. So I think for me, that's always the same. It's about, am I willing to submit even, even something as simple as a podcast, you know, it's not like this podcast. If this podcast had one, one download for the next year, would you continue to do it? And I'll be honest, a lot of us do this. We start off saying, well, I want to build a big platform because I want to reach people with the gospel. At some point, we're just kind of preaching the gospel to build a big platform. It shifts. Yeah. And the, the culture we're in, in which we all have this, this ability to be influencers, this ability to be a star on TikTok, whatever it may be, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's too enticing. 
and our pride kind of swells up and suddenly we're doing stuff really more because we like how it looks on Instagram. Like if we didn't put it on Instagram, did we really do it? <laughs> right. I mean, it's like, is it worth doing if we can't put it on Instagram? I mean, seriously, if you don't think young people are, I struggle with that at 60. If you're a public figure, like used to be, you could be a private Christian. Pretty much everyone was a private Christian, except for the pastor and maybe a couple of people on TV. Now everyone's a public Christian, has the ability to write their own YouTube channel, to do their own website, to have their own podcast, to be famous within their community. Everyone's famous somewhere now. Well, that's going to be a problem because that's where I think the struggle is for all of us who are public Christians is. And we saw it with Ravi Zacharias. Yes. And so, you know, there's these, there, there are these cautionary tales that are out there. You had Kosti Han on, so you already know that cautionary tales that are out there, but uh, it doesn't mean we don't struggle with it still because no one writes a book. They want no one to read. No one records a podcast. They want no one to download or listen to. And there begins the struggle with pride and the struggle with what's important and what am i why am i what are my motives really so i struggle with those things too and i'm constantly having to keep myself in check and i don't feel sometimes like i'm getting any better at it like i don't feel like sometimes i don't know if i'm moving toward i'm comforted often by the paul's words in romans 7 right just this idea that yeah I, i still do the things i know i shouldn't do and i don't do the things i know i should and, and I don't know how far Paul was, you know, he writing Romans. He's pretty far along in his walk. And yet he's still making these claims. He's, he's, he's decades into his walk. So I think that this probably should give us courage to know, you know, the, to encourage includes the word courage. Yes. When you're encouraging somebody, you're not just heaping praise on them. You're actually trying to help them to have the guts to keep going when they feel like quitting. And they don't have it. Yeah, to have courage. Yeah. So I want to encourage all of you listening that, yeah, we're all struggling with these things. And some of them are deeper. You might think that yours is deeper and darker than somebody else's, but it's not really. Like we're all humans. We're all men. Men struggle with this. It's not, don't be surprised that we struggle with the exact same things. Like, duh. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's what you should expect. Um, but again, the question is, are we still in the struggle? I just don't want to give up the struggle because then I'll know I've just succumbed to it. So as long as I feel like I'm in the struggle, I feel like, okay, there's still hope. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, one thing I just want to say to close today is I, I so appreciate your sincerity, uh, your love as a brother in Christ, uh, just for you taking the time to come on to our podcast and, and to really exhort us in the Lord to encourage us and to be candid and, and transparent just with where you're at and in your daily fight. Uh, and walking with Jesus. So uh, more than most people on the show, just thank you for being so personal and real and genuine and loving. Um, and we just are continually grateful for the work that God is giving you to do. And we just pray that you would continue to seek his Holy Spirit to be empowered and enabled for the work that he has for you to come. So uh, if you would allow me the honor, would you allow me to pray for you and yes, please. for us as we close? Yep. yep. All right. Father, I thank you just right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. God, thank you for the opportunity to serve you, to do ministry for you, to make your name great. Uh, in a day in which everyone is made famous in some way, help us to continue to live for you and for your fame and your renown to make your name known. God, and along those same lines, I just want to pray for our brother, Jay Warner Wallace. Thank you for Jim. Thank you for his ministry, for his testimony, for his faithfulness. Thank you for him. I pray that you would protect his integrity. I pray that you'd protect his ministry, that you would help him to constantly walk in the power of the Holy Spirit as he ministers to students as he ministers to families, as he writes, whatever it may be, just fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit and help him to not walk in the flesh, but to walk in the spirit and to experience life every single day. Help him to set aside the old cloak of himself and and to put on Christ. Thank you for his faithfulness. We just pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, both of you. I just want to thank both of you, actually, just for for having me on. I appreciate it. There there are not a lot of um, podcasts that are this focused um, on what it is to disciple and how important that is. And so keep up the good work. And I hope to come out and visit you someday soon. Maybe we'll go to a a Jayhawk game. (laughs) 
Okay. You know, right. it, if you're available, we can get you out here. There's a university called Ottawa University. And if you don't mind being a, a guest speaker, then we'd love to bring you out and hang out at the church. So universities are the best place to do ministry. So yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I look okay. forward to seeing you guys. All right, brother. Thanks Pretty again. Good. Appreciate it. See you, Jim. Thank uh, you. Bye-bye.